Uh, long time no see. Um, I am Ben Sparango. I am the head of BD at Solana Labs. Uh, joined here today by some of the folks both in infrastructure in the Solana ecosystem as well as uh, the DeFi ecosystem uh, to talk about how institutions are coming to DeFi. Uh, so to start, I'll open it up, let everybody introduce themselves and their project. Hi, I'm Marius. I'm the co-founder of Hubble Protocol. It's a protocol where you can take loans against Bitcoin, ETH, SOL uh, in a stable coin called USDH, which you can then take and buy more Bitcoin to leverage up or you can take it to Camino Finance, which is the place where you can earn yield on market making vaults uh, based on you know, stablecoin exposure only. Sure, so I'm Mike Milner, so head of sales for Europe, Middle East and Africa over at Copper. For those that don't know, as we started off first and foremost as a custodian, and that's evolved to be a broader safeguarding and trading infrastructure provider. Hi, my name is Omer. Uh, I lead product strategy for Web3 uh, in Fireblocks. Uh, so uh, Fireblocks is the, is the bis biggest uh, custody solution provider for <laughs> financial institutions. We deal with a whole range of, uh, of customers from uh, traditional banks that we just launched with BNY, um, all, to, all through providing infrastructure for uh, Web3 companies and uh, some of the more, more ambitious projects out there. So happy to be here. My name is Olev. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Friction. Friction is a Solana DeFi protocol that builds portfolio management Legos uh, or strategies that sit across the uh, risk reward curve of DeFi. Hi, everyone. My name is Will Barnes, uh, co founder and CEO of Jet Protocol. Jet is a fixed rate, fixed term borrowing protocol built on an order book. Thanks, guys. Um, so, to kick it off, I want to talk about institutions and what that means to everybody here. Uh, people have different definitions of what institutions coming to DeFi means. So I um, would love for each of you to just touch on what does, what, what does an institution mean to you? Um, who are those players and how you're interfacing with them? I mean, for us, institutions is just by definition not retail. Uh, people that have money to invest on behalf of someone else uh, most, uh, most of the times. So we talk to, we try to figure out, you know, who can use Hubble and Camino. And uh, we try to reach out to funds uh, and other, you know, investors and see who they can they recommend, who is this product for. And um, the best, you know, the best um, client we thought it would be, you know, f hedge funds that are crypto native, that, uh, you know, have interest from outside traditional investors. They want to have some crypto exposure. And um, most of them, when we talk to them, they say, you know, we have some stable coins. We have a mandate that we can invest some stable coins, earn some yield on them. Uh, we can deploy, but you know we need to do all the due diligence and make sure we stay on stablecoin exposure only. So it's DeFi funds or VCs which have a DeFi strategy also, like a liquid fund, and they do some farming. This is our kind of, um, these are our connections. Mike? Sure. So, I mean, I think we've all been sat on panels now for years saying, you know, institutional capital's coming, institutional capital's coming, and, you know, it's pretty much on every single one of these things. And I think the truth is it's really only, and it comes down to your definition, of course, which I'll come on to, but it's only really happening now, at least in our opinion, over the course of the last six, nine, maybe 12 months or so, that you are seeing the traditional buy side players really, you know, really weighing in and go past that testing stage of, you know, we've got 100, 200 grand in this thing, and they're really now starting to deploy serious capital, more so on the centralized side, not so much in DeFi right now, but yeah, for us, that's, that's the real definition. Then, of course, you've got the crypto native version, which is, you know, your standard crypto native hedge fund with, you know, five to 100 million AUM, prop firms, VCs, as we mentioned, and so on and so forth. Yes, I mean, so I, I have to agree, I think, but when we talk about institutions, it's not like a one size fits all. Um, there are many types of institutions with different risk appetites, with different portfolio, like, and, and actually different expertise when it comes to like actual trading, right? Um, it depends on their background, but what we see is a, like a wide range, right? For us, eventually, we want to give, the, give them the ability to pursue any strategy, any investment strategy that they like, maybe centralized finance, like CFI through exchanges or uh, DeFi through protocols, right? So, I mean, you want to give them the entire range of actually pursuing their strategy and make sure that they can easily and securely just uh, um, like implement that strategy and, and execute on it. Um, so for us, I think it's like the, the main, um, I guess, I wouldn't say focus, but one of the main challenges is to 
go out to these ecosystems, right, and understand and how we um, kind of look at all the different very like very uh, um, ambitious protocols and uh, and give our customers a way to uh, execute on that and like uh, tie that all to one to one ecosystem. So I think that's what we're seeing. Yeah, I think some good points made so far. The way I think we bucket it in three categories generally is you have crypto curious institutions, crypto native institutions, and then DeFi native institutions. So as we try to dive in on the institutional side, one thing that's really important to us is uh, the guiding principle of risk. So what is the, the risk profile of the institution? How much capital are they looking to deploy? What level of um, risk are they willing to take? And then how do they isolate smart contract risk in their traditional um, portfolio management or strategy management policies? And a big focus for us is trying to bridge that gap, right? You need custodial solutions like copper and fire blocks. You need uh, reporting solutions that don't really exist in DeFi today. So a lot of it is on a kind of one-off basis, as, as Omer mentioned, but a ton of work we have to do to make the, the onboarding smooth for them. I think of uh, institutions mostly as people who trade professionally for their job, not retail, or people who just day trade. Generally, someone who's formed a company and they sign up with exchanges and arbitrage and all kinds of stuff like that. But typically, they are doing this as for a full-time job. And we've been thinking mostly about pretty small institutions, I would say, Firms to do like, or individual traders who do $5 million of volume weekly, which is pretty, actually pretty substantial amount of volume for, for a trader on DeFi. Uh, but then, you know, as you go up the stack, if you have like a big bank, that's gonna be an integration that takes years, and uh, they're just fundamentally different institutions from a big bank to a startup. Uh, you know, a big bank is funded perpetuity almost in a startup, like very scrappy and small. So like there's big mismatches and potential integrations. And yeah, we think about that when we approach integrations as well. So when institutions are coming to each of you, you guys are in, the, the three of you are, are DeFi applications, the two of you are custodial providers. You are being approached with different questions from these institutions. So. Starting with the custodial providers, uh, Mike or Omer, just what, when, a, when an institution approaches you guys, what, what's important to them? Why, why are they coming to you and why are they using your services? Sure, so on our side, we usually one of the first point of contacts for that question of what don't we know. Like these institutions haven't really dabbled in DeFi yet. They are moving in and they just want to understand the broader scope of where is the risk? What have you seen go wrong in the past? How can we mitigate against that? What is best practice? And then how do we wrap, you know, not only the risk analysis component around that, but the governance piece as well. I mean, fundamentally, we are still operating in an asset class that is anonymous with very little path for recourse. So every part of the conversation has got to be grounded in that context. So for us, it really is a broad statement of they don't have specific questions. They're not asking, you know, EVM versus non-EVM. They're going big picture. How do we protect the assets? And then from there, we can generate alpha afterwards. But it's getting comfortable and putting governance around all of this. No, so I, I definitely agree. I think that um, you know, there's a, a, a first question of like, why DeFi, how DeFi, like, how do we do that? How do we make it secure? How do we put the controls in, right? How, like, how, how like on, let's say on EVMs, like, how do I not give like an approve for infinite amount of like uh, this token to that protocol that I don't know like uh, what's going to happen in the future? So these are like the basic security questions that that come up. But I think for like the more DeFi native funds, right? It's always about how do you get like more protocols, more, they're always kind of leading the pack, always saying, okay, so when is this chain? It's like, what chain? Can you repeat that? It's like, okay, we'll go out and, and check it out and see what, like they're always kind of pushing the envelope on all these because they want to utilize the security, they want to use, utilize like they want to have one system in which they manage all their funds, right, and deploy from there. But then on the other hand, like y they always keep pushing the envelope on like more and more chains and more and more like uh, protocols. So I guess it's both of these. Sure. J j to quickly double down on that, um, I think both, both of you have products by which you make it easier for your clients to utilize DeFi. So Copper has Copper Connect, Fireblocks has a, a similar product. Yeah. And so the, the extension and also our uh, Wallet Connect integration and our DeFi SDK, which you can actually automate stuff programmatically with, uh, with DeFi. Okay. So can, can you explain like 
the like design considerations and and around that and why you know a, a large uh, large AUM institution would be more inclined to utilize your product to interface with DeFi than like, you know, custodying their own assets and, and, and interfacing directly from a ledger or a phantom wallet? Yeah, I mean, so uh, that's that's kind of an, an easy question in that regard, right? So you want you want to utilize, like, bo I think both Copper and Fireblocks, right? We, we provide, like, a highly secure and very flexible uh, system to actually operate on. Um, so... Uh, you want to utilize first our security protocol and then our governance, right, in terms of who needs to sign what at what amount and which day and, and all of that. So you would need to want to put that governance. And you want to take all these, uh, let's say, treasury management type of uh, um, setup that, uh, you know, that, went through, you know, the CFO and like, you know, uh, the CISO of the company to make sure that no one's like going to run off with the, with anything that uh, they're not supposed to and eliminating like a single point of failure. So they take that as like the default. This is where we need to originate all our transactions from. And then from there, they just go, okay, so how do you make that easy for us to actually go out and do that, right? So we, in, in an iterative manner, we just build more and more. And you, as I've said, even like the, the, uh, the like the DeFi native um, institutions, they're actually more, gra they, they don't need like, a, a, at some points they don't even need like a, a MetaMask-like experience for their traders. They actually automate all those stuff with like using uh, programmatic access, right? So they're super savvy, super smart, um, trying to like do like yield, uh, yield generation on top of multiple DeFi protocols. So you need to provide that access as well. So it's like this whole range of experience. And I think actually very similar to what you've mentioned yeah. there, there's that whole governance piece, right? It's fundamentally who can add a whitelist to a new smart contract, who's doing the audit for that, what are the permissions, et cetera, that you can layer on top of the team. And then actually going a step further than this, it's, okay, let's say we do all the governance, but it turns out fundamentally we were wrong, we're, inter we're interacting with a contract that you know has malicious code, whatever it may be, and something goes wrong. How can you then segregate that environment to at least put a backstop on your maximum loss, so to speak, should something go wrong? So one thing that we've been working on and released quite recently is actually segregated environments per protocol. So for example, let's say you've been in DeFi for a while, you're comfortable with EVM chains, et cetera. You can have one segregated environment, no single point of failure, et cetera, there. And you can have that team with one set of permissions, but then let's say you then move to non-EVM, Solana, whatever it may be, and fundamentally you can put a more cautious structure and governance around this with less capital and keep those two things entirely segregated. Got it. Um, and then moving over to the DeFi teams, I'll start with you, Will. Uh, when you guys are interfacing with institutions, uh, what, are, what are the things, what are the questions that they're surfacing to you guys, and how are you guys building products to, to better serve those needs? Yeah, they're usually, th most are pretty sophisticated, and they know, they know more than, you know, like, they could talk to blockchain about you, like, with you. And, but they don't actually understand, you know, what the protocol does, what a DeFi protocol does. But I think that's even common among people who are in DeFi, you're like, when you look at a protocol at face value, you're like not really sure what it does. You have to really dig in the docs because they, they do really esoteric stuff. And uh, it helps, I found, especially for a like credit fund just in particular, like if you can explain it and say, with this protocol, with our protocol, you can remove all your you know, loan servicing costs because they like understand that. And they think, okay, like I'm saving costs here. And then you can just add things like Quick settlement, you can access it, a continuous uh, like market at any time, and and then it like handles everything thereafter for you if it needs to liquidate. And like for them, you know, when they do a lot of manual uh, paperwork, if they, I mean, credit funds are pretty manual in general. Like they like that, and then they're attracted to it, want to learn more about it. But of course, a big fund like that is slow moving. You have to sort of you know work it into the discussion. But they like. They definitely always see the value. They, and yeah, it helps when you just explain like cost savings or like how convenient it is for you. Yeah, that's also convenience is one thing. It has to be convenient. Um, and uh, yeah, there's always security, I think. That is because, you know, they see the headlines and they'll like talk about the headlines when you talk to them. And, you know, you always have an answer for that. Like always the headlines are usually pretty sensational, sensationalist. But uh, I think. All in all, like they're really impressed with the level of dialogue between institutions nowadays compared to 2018. It's like yeah. night and day difference. It's a, yeah. It sounds like it, they're they're much more willing to like work with us to find a common solution. Um, yeah. And like 
some of you guys are building products to like service them, like like Udav, you guys just announced a, a product today. Um, would you like to, to touch on that? Yeah, we're really excited to launch Friction Institutional today, which is what we think DeFi's real first attempt at onboarding institutional grade DeFi clients. Um, may not be DeFi native today, may not be crypto native today, may be very crypto curious, but very savvy in the traditional markets. Uh, we think this is a big unlock for DeFi because it enables a couple of things. Uh, all these people come to us, institutions come to us and ask for three things really. They ask for security, they ask for risk management, and they ask for real yield. Right? And, and to get them these three things uh, requires a lot more than what most of DeFi offers today. We were talking about this behind is like there's no standardization of risk metrics in DeFi today. You need verified identity, you need on and off chain risk score tracking. So the first product under Friction Institutional uh, is going to be an institutional credit product which brings under collateralized lending at a fixed rate, fixed term into DeFi with meaningful amount of lender protection, borrower diversification, and duration risk management. We think without these things, the, the crypto credit markets will have a tough time scaling, particularly as we see uh, treasury yields rise across uh, the traditional world. And DeFi starts to become uh, uncompetitive, frankly. So we have a lot of work to do as DeFi platforms, as the people who onboard users into DeFi, to build that experience and really build a relationship business out of this too. I think uh, relationships are a big part of what DeFi needs to scale. And a lot of us on stage here are working really actively to, to onboard some of the institutions who are kind of sitting at the fence and haven't really understood DeFi for what it is. Uh, so transparent risk management and, and real yield is something we think will drive the, the next big cycle of DeFi adoption from institutions. Cool. Maris, you want to touch? <coughs> yeah, uh, when we talk to institutions, they want to know what's the yield and what's the risk, basically. Um, you know, a lot of the times the yield advertised is not realized. You know, you can have like 20% today, but 3% tomorrow. So they want to see historical realized uh, APR and they want to know what the risk is. And some of them, quite a lot of them, they go really deep into what testing framework do you use? Um, how many tests do you have on your code base? How many audits? Can I see the audits? Um, is there a multi-sig? Is there governance? Um, how long have you been alive? Sorry, how, how, how long has the uh, protocol been alive? D did you have incidents? They go really like, you know, um, very diligent into, into assessing this. Some of them, you know, there's different levels of uh, tolerance. Um, they want to see um, how many users, you know, proof of, you know, like kind of like social proofing or like uh, proof that you haven't been, there have been no incidents. And um, they want to see the code. They, they send like their quant or their engineer to check out the code. You know, they, they don't, you know, they, they see the, 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 the news like you mentioned, you know, and they're like, uh, don't want to be part of uh, any of any exploits. So this is number one. And after that, they ask, OK, what's the product? How do you make? How do you earn any yield? And um, they want to, to uh, deconstruct the yield between, you know, wherever there are fees, uh, what are the um, emissions part, how long are the emissions going to last? Um, and after that, once they're happy, with, you know, there's a long, long, you know, process. Uh, they have, we have multiple calls. They ask, who are the founders? What have you done before? You know, it's really diligent. And then uh, ultimately, they start with like a small amount. They put a small amount, they check it out, they claim the you know the yield, they give us feedback, and then um, and then if they're happy, which some of them are, uh, they continue and they they provide back pro feedback to us. Well, you brought up a great point there. Is that one one thing that has like continually plagued uh, crypto is just hacks. Like software inherently has infinite unknown unknowns, and you're never going to be fully certain that. Uh, something is you know rock solid and can't be manipulated in some way either from a code level or from an economic perspective so what are, what are some ways that you guys are seeing people iterate on security measures uh, getting better audits building in insurance funds to kind of build more consumer confidence because uh, you know fundamentally none of us want to put our assets into into DeFi protocols if you know there's a risk of you losing your principal um, so Whoever wants to go ahead. Yeah, we've, we've been thinking a lot about risk. So um, because we have been talking to, to these institutions and uh, we realized that we added measures that b literally mimic the things that are in traditional finance. Some of them are literally, you know, some of our people in our team used to work in traditional finance to say, look, this is what we did in the bank. And then we implemented it and we realized it makes so much sense. Uh, so we had things like, you know, uh, withdrawal, net withdrawal caps. So, you know, we limit the amount that can be taken out of the protocol over a four-hour period. 
and then it gets reset. So even if there's an exploit, at least it's, it's, it's capped. Mm -hmm. We're adding like price bands on oracles. Uh, I think SBF was mentioning that they do that on the risk engine. So, you know, um, if it's a stable coin, cap it at 1.5, you know. Um, so, and below, you know, 0 0.5, at least, you know, halt the protocol or like halt deposits or things that could harm the protocol in case uh, these things happen. So they're really like traditional finance, we're a little bit reinventing the wheel, but a very, at a very fast pace because it's just, you know, smart contract code. So we can test, we have the um, feedback loop is quite, uh, quite fast. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. And basically risk management. So we realized when we launched Hubble that we have to do risk management. We thought we were writing a smart contract, but we have to, you know, think about volatility and liquidity and price drops and stuff like that. And um, more and more people, like for example, Gauntlet, are building these like Monte Carlo simulations where you can predict or like uh, with like 95% uh, confidence say what what will happen in case if this token drops by 30% given the existing liquidity. Is your protocol at risk? Can you liquidate? Do you have enough, um, you know, liquidity on, on the DEX? Yep. Mike? And I think the point you read that read there, Ben, I mean, that's fundamentally the obstacle to broader adoption, right, from the TradFi market that's moving in. I mean, it's kind of hedge fund 101. You take LP capital, hedge the principal, then generate alpha with whatever strategy you're running from there. And crypto is a very unique asset class insofar as you're almost risking 100% of the principal on every single transaction. Fundamentally, if you send this to the wrong wallet address, if you've got assets sitting on exchanges, smart contracts, whatever it may be, you've almost got this prevalent risk consistently running on that. So there are ways to solve it on the centralized exchanges. That's something that we've done. But on the DeFi side, I think that's where we have seen much lower adoption as compared to the centralized side, because you can almost assess your credit risk. You can see what's going on. You can assess the balance sheet, et cetera. Smart contracts, incredibly opaque, and there are very few people in the world that are you know, truly capable of assessing that risk. So I think it's um, really hitting the nail on the head. But I'm sure you guys see similar. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean I th I there are actually two questions, right? I mean, how do DeFi protocols actually make sure that they're like as secure as they can be from, like, a, I guess, a financial logical layer that they have uh, in, in their back? And like, how can investors or like uh, institutions or retail protect themselves against like I if something goes wrong, right? I mean, these are two, uh, th those two carry the burden like different, right? So w for institutions, obviously they need to have like a reliable wallet infrastructure that is secure and also allows them to kind of, you know, either uh, pull their funds out when something happens or to have a moni monitoring capabilities of like the DeFi protocols that they're in and make sure that they like cut their losses in the chance uh, on the chance that something like there's a there's an exploit um, so again putting like your policies in place making sure that you're not overexposed that you know uh, everything that you do fit like the uh, exactly like the the manifest of the portfolio and the risk management that you actually taken into uh, consideration um, that's on like the you know on the on the institution side on the customer side on the defi side listen i mean uh, maybe i have like a, a little bit of a di different of a like it's a different opinion i think it's a rapidly evolving um, ecosystem like where we were like two years ago is not even close to where we are right now in terms of like the range of the products that are being served. You just spoke in a, like a real world asset panel, right? I mean, we're constantly iterating and those iterations, they're costly, right? I mean, but like they're failing fast and improving and failing fast and improving. We'll keep seeing, unfortunately, we'll keep seeing some of these, but I think it's a price that you pay for innovation. And this whole space is like just fueled on like innovation and like pushing the envelope and doing these types of things. So yeah, yes, there is a price, but the gain in like, you know, five to 10 years will be amazing sure. the, the way that I see it. Good and well quickly before we're uh, wrapped up here. Yeah, I think the concepts about the policies need to be put in place by protocols, like you all mentioned, protocols in ever, across DeFi that require some element of standardization. I think what we find particularly interesting is the concept of insurance in DeFi. Um, we think traditionally Friction's kind of core product has been around the, the concept of call and put options. Obviously, put options are a very good reflection of the price of insurance if you can properly price them. That is, uh, and, and something that we're particularly attracted by is the concept of insurance funds, which you alluded to. Um, the, if you look at what the United States does as the Federal Depository Insurance Commission, uh, the FDIC, they insure $9 trillion of assets um, with a deposit insurance fund of about $120 billion. So that's like a 1.2%. Uh, reserve ratio, right? And this is responsible for essentially bailing out banks that are defaulting. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about DeFi is we don't have a central governance structure like this, right? That's kind of one of the value premises. So we're exploring a lot about building these things and always interested in chatting with folks who uh, 
um, are in the same space. We, we're unfortunately out of time, but thank you guys for joining us today, and thank you to the panelists for, for coming up here. Thanks. Thanks.